Thanks, Andy. Thanks for uh, setting this up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, user engagement that we've been doing. Um, it's been a really exciting time to be involved with Painter. There's uh, been a lot of opportunity to engage with our customers. And um, I think back actually to a really neat conversation I had um, actually well over a year ago with Don Siegmiller. He's one of our Painter masters. And uh, we were just having a discussion about Painter and he was there. And something that was really neat is he was talking about what it's like to work with the students and how they're sometimes overwhelmed with the choice and all these uh, brushes and tools that they're able to use. And, and he said, you know, Steve, Andy, it's about the art. It's about what they create. It's not about the tool. And that's something that he imparted to the students. And that laid the groundwork for a framework that we use to engage with our users. So we started to think about this idea of creation. And Painter does a huge amount of creation. And we said, well, what are, what's more to this process, this artistic process? There's inspiration at the beginning of what you do before you go to create digital art. And then there's what you do after you've completed. You reflect and share on what you've done. So this framework was what we used to talk to our artists. And we created the About the Artist series. And we wanted to ask what's motivating you, what's inspiring you, what matters today, what you're doing today, what uh, the challenges are today, what's going to happen in the future, what's, what's a threat, what's an opportunity, and how you start to move forward and grow. Regardless of the tool that you're using, whether you're using Painter or anything else, we just wanted to hear. And it was a great uh, way to facilitate the discussion. So um, moving forward with that, I mean, this, this is actually a picture of a couple of the uh, user engagement uh, series we did. We did quite a bit of this. And uh, this is uh, Jeremy Sutton and team in San Francisco. Uh, he hosted a conference at uh, his beautiful studio, and then Betty Miner, also in Los Angeles in the same area. Um, these kinds of sessions were the beginnings of this approach and this way to discuss and share, and uh, it was super exciting. So it was great to have all of them there. And um, really what we, what we learned throughout all this, as we started to push beyond creation and started to talk more and more about what's going on here, we talked about, we learned about the, the context that you're working in. The studios, what does a digital art studio look like? Um, you know, what, what is it like when you go on location? You, you're not always just working in a studio. And what's it like to shoot reference material, to actually photograph people, or to create a story um, if you're working in illustration, those kinds of examples, storyboarding, et cetera, and started to really tie all this together to learn more about your process. And, you know, here's an example. We actually uh, attended a Greenlight Summit, which is a fantastic series. Um, uh, through uh, Jason Manley. And what we were able to learn in depth were some of these workflows. Like, for example, this is an illustration workflow. And you can see there's traditional tools being used here, just a, you know, a regular sketch, shooting a reference, and then generating um, artwork towards the end. And these workflows are very important. Seeing artists' work was a great part of what we were able to do throughout this journey. And, um, you know, as, as we talked about this, as we saw the output, and as artists were sharing what they were creating with each other, they were learning from each other, which is really exciting. So uh, each of you teach each other, each of you inspire each other. We heard lots about uh, working with music as an important opportunity. We heard lots about actually printing the output. And we heard lots about these, these critical workflows that uh, are really important for you when you're working with Painter. So um, with that, it was, it was an interesting segue into what we needed to do for X3. And we really started to ask ourselves, okay, what's going on? What's, what's the state of the nation with Painter 12? And we, we asked ourselves, well, gee, what's our look and feel? And I guess it really came across to us that our look and feel was maybe somewhere in between a nuclear control panel with all those sliders and all those little adjustments, and then also something like an art store, which is, you know, this joyous um, selection of, of uh, colors and brushes and things that you can find and pick and choose to get going. And, you know, Painter is somewhere in between here. And, you know, how to make it more about the art? How to make it more about the artist? That was the question on our mind. So um, with that, that uh, set up a series of, uh, of challenges that we presented to ourselves to try and improve the experience in Painter. And, you know, this is one that maybe many of you have faced up to this point. I mean, you hit Control-B and you get, uh, in Painter 12-2, 26 control panels 
bombarding you, trying to pick and choose which one to make a brush selection, it can be really overwhelming. So you'll see we're going to demonstrate today that we want that experience to be a lot easier, a lot smoother, and we're making steps to make that happen. And uh, in addition to that, um, we've been working on the overall brush experience. So um, lots of improvements there in terms of actually finding a brush and getting going and creating art, right? So um, you'll see we're going to demonstrate brush search, jitter searches, uh, sorry, brush search, jitter brushes, which are really exciting. That's going to add some organic feel to it. Um, we've enhanced stroke preview. Tanya's going to show how this all ties together into a workflow relating to working with brushes, which is something you do every day and the most key part of Painter. So with that, I'm going to segue into Tanya, and she's going to do an amazing demo for us. All right. So when you first fire up Painter X3, the very first thing that you're going to see is the welcome screen that's going to greet you. Where on the window on the right here, this is the artwork gallery, and you can find great inspiration from this. We've actually loaded this up with all new Painter X3 artwork, um, a lot of artwork from the artists that we've been working with over the past year and a half or so. And you can browse through this. You can also link out to the artist's websites and learn a little bit more about them. If you take a look over on the left, you can find out what's new, link over directly to our online training and help. Brush tracking is one of the most important things to fire up when you first launch Painter. This is going to set Painter to your particular pressure sensitivity as a global setting. So I'll just go ahead and set that right now. You can also adjust the brush tracking for each individual brush. So let's begin by creating a brand new image, and I'll go with the default color and paper texture. And at this point, I need to find a brush to use. So I'm going to come up to the brush selector in the top left-hand corner. And these are all in alphabetical order. And on the left, you've got your brush category. On the right, you have the variations. And you can see, or the variants, I should say, on the, um, the original brush media category you select. If you take a look in the bottom of the window there, you're seeing a real-time preview. We've updated this brush preview so that it's much more accurate to avoid you having to create those test canvases. You can now just take a look at the stroke preview and get a great idea of what that brush is going to do for you. And in case you hadn't noticed, um, you can easily click on any brush category and just click to drag to rearrange it within the category panel. You can also do this with variants. Now let's say that you want to just see um, what's new in Painter X3. I'm going to come to the top right-hand corner to the brush search engine. This is brand new. And I type in X3. This is now showing me all of the new brushes that are native just to Painter X3. A lot of them have the name Jitter. So I'm going to go ahead and select an interesting FX Fog Jitter brush, mix up a little color here and I'm going to come out on the canvas, and I'll size my brush up a little bit more here so you can see. See these beautiful brush strokes? They're very organic. They don't follow, they're not staying within the lines. They kind of jump out of the lines and give you a nice, unique, organic effect to your artwork. And I'd like to credit, um, Karen Sperling created a wonderful video for us, and you can see her example of using the jitter brushes, and I'm drawing the same sorts of trees that she was using in her video. So I'd like to thank her for using such a great example. So that is um, typing in X3, seeing some of the new jitter brushes. Now we use the color wheel, but we also have the color mixer. And we changed the default to sample color instead of add color to the mixer palette. So I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to take advantage of this brush search tool, if I could talk and type at the same time, and I'm going to type in Impressionist this time. And now I've got a variety of Impressionist brushes. So now I searched on a style. We've got the standard mixer, as I mentioned, but while working with all the artists recently, they said, hey, you know what, we think it would be a great idea to add custom mixer pads. So here's one from Jeremy Sutton. I'll just come out and sample a little color from his mixer pad and I can begin to paint with that. And you can see it with the Impressionist brush, it's following the direction that my stylus is pointing and that I'm stroking out there on the canvas. This color set is from John Malcolm. So he's um, a concept artist, much more organized in his approach. Then we have 
Karen Boniker, traditional artist. So I could sample some colors from within her palette there. We could also sample from anything on the page here. And then finally, we have Skip Allen's mixer pad. Okay, so another interesting setup. You can create your own mixer palettes and you can save them, exchange them with others. I could also go back and restore my default mixer from here if I'd like to. Okay, so that's just a little bit about the color set. Now, this brush is interesting, the Impressionist brush. I see some variation on my strokes here, but I'd actually like to add even a little more jitter to this. So traditionally, to open up your brush controls, you would come to your window menu, go to brush control panel, control B. Okay, that's the quick key for it. And remember back to the slide that Steve had where he showed if you open up all these panels, it takes up your entire user interface. And experimenting or kind of, you know, browsing through here, trying to figure out which of these parameters can be changed for the brush at hand can be challenging at times. So what we decided to do was to get smart about things. And up on the property bar, we have something called advanced brush controls. And I will open this up. So this now gives me only the brush, or actually the top used parameters that people make adjustments to for their brushes. So you can see it's much more slimmed down. I'm gonna come and I wanna point out on the bottom, the stroke preview here, because this is a real time preview. So if I begin to adjust the angle of the brush, and let's just pan over here so that you can see my tree a little bit better and I throw a stroke down. See that really interesting, that angle variation on my brush now. I can adjust the jitter for opacity. And what this does is throughout my individual brush dab strokes on this particular brush, there's different levels or varying levels of opacity. You can adjust for size. I'll go ahead and bump that one up and we can sample from over here. So making these universal jitter adjustments to a variety of parameters in your brushes is brand new to Painter X3 and really super exciting. So let's take these stroke jitter all the way up and now you can see it's really jumping away from my stroke there. So that is the brand new advanced brush control universal jitter. Now we'll close out of the standard brush control and I wanna do one more thing. I'm gonna come over to the colors once more. And you could always create a color set in Painter, but we now have a new capability where if I wanted to create a color set from the image that I have open here, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And you can either minimize, you can see I can have just one color if that's all I want, or maximize up to 256 colors. Previously, you had no control over the number of colors that would be added to the color set. And this is a wonderful way in the case of minimizing the colors of a way to unify your compositions. You start with a um, slimmer color set, much easier way to unify that painting composition when you get working. So that's the new color set capability. Now I'm gonna come back up to the brush search engine, and this time I'm gonna type in real watercolor, which was a wonderful addition to Painter 12, and then I'm gonna add another search parameter, detail. And look how much this narrowed down my choice in brushes. So I'll select my real wet detail brush. And if we take a look at the smart brush controls or the advanced brush control panel, I have my media panel right here. So I could change a paper texture on the fly, which I will do. And we'll just get a nice bright green. And I'm gonna zoom in to the canvas so that you guys can really see what I'm gonna do here. Go ahead and zoom in. And we're gonna throw a watercolor stroke down on the bottom of the page. And what you can see is that it's darker where the grooves of the paper texture are and the paint color is lighter where the ridges are. Now, in Painter 12.2, we, we released something called flow maps. And you all may not know what a flow map is. So a flow map is a beautiful addition to both our wet, real wet oils and real wet watercolors that allows me to incorporate, if you take a look in the media panel here, two different textures. One is called a flow map texture. These have much um, deeper valleys and higher peaks, and then also the paper texture. So watch what happens. Let's come down on the bottom here, and we'll kind of overlap these strokes so that you can see how interesting this is. 
And one of the painter masters that uses these quite a bit and created tons of videos for you guys is Skip Allen. So you can see it's incorporating both the flow map texture and the paper texture to create a really organic, lovely effect, the way that the watercolors are blending there. So I just wanted to make sure that you all knew about the flow map. So Steve, well, on the, sub on the subject of brushes, Tanya, a question has come in about uh, Painter 12 brushes. Are those compatible with Painter X3? Sure. So you can pull up your previous brushes. You can see right here, I just went to the brush selector. I could select my Painter 12 brushes, Painter 11 brushes. And um, while we're here, I might as well import some brushes. We've made this much easier. So I'm going to say, let's import a brush category. And what do you know, I have some Skip Allen's brushes here because they're so lovely. So let's bring in some buttery oils. And if we take a look now, it's actually placed Skip's entire buttery oils brush category at the bottom of my list here. So it's so simple to import and export custom brushes now. And you could also easily create your own brushes. So because we had customized the Impressionist brush in order to create a custom um, brush palette, you just hold shift and drag out and there you have your custom brushes. And you can continue to add brushes in here or add commands. So I went off on a little tangent there, but just wanted to show you guys what the, all the things that you can do with these brushes. And I'll just add one more little tidbit since we're doing it, Tanya. Mm -hmm. On the brush search, you can also shift, drag off on your brush search results and use that to make a custom palette. So if you don't like spending a lot of time going to the brush drawer and you remember those names of those brushes you used in 12, you can uh, just type in a search term and find it that way and make your custom palette. So Thanks definitely compatible that. with 12, yeah. Another question, how do you import the other brushes from prior versions? Not clear on that. Okay, so are we talking before? Oh, yeah, the import would work with prior versions. So if you had an 11 brush, uh, you can import it through the same mechanism that Tanya showed you there. You can import either an individual brush, a brush library, or a brush category. So uh, I think uh, for, to, to answer your question, it sounds like you're just going to import an individual brush. So that's available in the menu, and uh, you can bring that in. Awesome. So we'll uh, head on to the next feature there. Uh, that's such a great demo, Tanya. I mean, it really ties the workflow together. We're so eager to see what you guys are able to create with these new features. We're always impressed and uh, look forward to you sharing on Painter Factory and, uh, of course, uh, our Painter Facebook page. So the other interesting thing, uh, you know, as we really started to dig into these workflows, I'm going to focus on a couple new features here. We're talking about perspective guides and reference. And to set this up, you know, engaging with the, um, the, the concept artists and the uh, illustrators and the comic book artists, you know, uh, perspective is kind of a tedious task at times. Getting that uh, perfect geometry that uh, really slams home high quality art and speed is a big factor here. I mean, you're creating dozens and dozens of these uh, drawings um, as you work. So uh, making every step a little bit easier is critical. And perspective is interesting because it's something that works really well um, you'll see that this tool will work really well for, for a very measured, perfect geometry. But we're even starting to hear of people using it for composition, for um, abstract and that sort of thing. So you can see an Android's painting on the left. It's even got a little bit of an abstract element blended in. So there's all sorts of uses of this tool. We we're pleasantly surprised how well it's received by a broad um, uh, range of artists working with this tool. So. Um, you know, perspective dates back to those days in the Renaissance period, a, you know, sort of an easy thing to look at here. Um, you know, this is a single point perspective. And back then they were using, you know, string and a pin to help line up their brushes and get that perfect look. So this is a long desired goal in, in art for, for years and years and years. So uh, we feel it's important. And uh, moving forward with that, uh, just to think a bit about how that might tie together a reference image, Kane's going to show you a bit of a workflow here. Um, not only are you looking for that perfect geometry in your composition, you might be looking for the lighting. You might be looking for the color, the contrast. You might be looking for some of the geometry, so that, some of the geometry that is part of the image you're about to build. So reference image is a long requested feature. 
uh, an important part of your workflows and not something we built into X3 as well. That's Mike Thompson, by the way, um, our painter master, an amazing illustrator. It's him doing a self-portrait, and you'll see that's even easier now in X3. So Tanya's going to uh, demonstrate that for us. Uh, go ahead, Tanya. All right. So back over to Painter here, and I will begin by opening up an image to work with. So let's go ahead. And I just did a little setup of my layers in advance here. So I happen to have an inspiration image on a layer. We can also use the reference image in addition to this. So what I would like to do is draw this city in perfect perspective, and we'll take a look over in the tool palette. So you see right down here, Perspective Guide. So I'll go ahead and turn that on. And then up on the Property Bar, this is giving me all of the properties for the Perspective Guide tool. So let me just quickly walk you through some of this information here. You can enable the Perspective Guide. So that is actually turning the guides on and off. And I'm going to go ahead and change the opacity here so that you can see the, the various tools that I'm going to walk through. So this, enable, I can turn it on and off. I can also guide my brush stroke to the guide by clicking perspective guided strokes. As long as that is on, your brush is going to snap to the guide. There are a variety of presets that we've given you, a one point, a two point standard horizon, three point top down, and a worm's eye view. And you can also save and create your own perspective guides, and I have one created down there. Okay, so if we just quickly kind of browse through these options here um, in the center, you have your horizon line, which I can grab and I can move that around. And then all the way over on the right, you have your intermediate lines, which are indeed turned on right now from my one point perspective, but I'll adjust the opacity and you can also increase the density of this. And this could come in handy while you're drawing your perspective. So I'm going to come back to the presets. Let's get our um, inspiration image there. And I am going to begin with a three-point worm's eye view. And I'll go ahead and zoom out so that you can actually see my three vanishing points. So I have one on the top here, one on the left, one over on the right. So the one on the top is what I'm going to use in order to adjust the perspective for my building. Okay, so you can see I'm just going to click to rotate. And I'm using the building in order to align the guide with. Okay, so just doing, you know, kind of a rough estimate here. Now, with those intermediate lines, you see when I turn these on, and I'll increase the opacity for you, this gives you much better idea of if you've actually done a, a good alignment with your guides. I'll turn that off just for the sake of you being able to see what I'm doing here. So now I want to come to the bridge, or as I like to call this upper and lower Wacker Drive, I'm from Chicago, but I don't think this is Chicago. So I'm going to grab that vanishing point, and we'll come up here, and I'm going to adjust the primary guideline, move it right there, take this bottom one, make sure that I've got that aligned with the bottom of the bridge. Now, the final vanishing point, we want to capture the street. So the street is kind of going, you know, from right to left. So let's grab this vanishing point. And then we'll come up and grab the guy on the top. Now, sometimes the navigator comes in handy. So if I wanted to grab the center handle of my guide, this makes it much easier. And I'm going to kind of rotate this just a tad. And there we go. Okay, so once I've done the setup, I'm going to go to my brush tool. And I'm going to open up my reference image because this is actually kind of my inspiration for what I want, the colors that I want to use, and just sort of a glowing city effect that I'm going to be going for. And I'm going to sample the color from the reference image. So that's, this is one way you could use it. And then we'll come up to liquid ink. These are some really neat brushes. And you see um, the preview is they're nice bristly strokes. So now, let's just move this guy over here. I'm just going to and roughly start to draw my city in. Okay, so you can see I'm not I'm not being super um, perfect here. I'm not going to get a whole illustration done for you guys, but I wanted to show you how quick and easy. Even if I come all the way back here, and it might help if I actually turned off. You can see it's giving me 
the perfect perspective. So no matter where I draw from, I'm able to get the building set in perspective. Okay, so I come up here. Now let's turn the that guide back off. I'm going to increase my brush size and we'll just throw down some real thick strokes. If I press lightly, this um, it gives me kind of that bristly effect. If I come all the way down on the bottom, you can get that street in there and I could even get all of this is in perfect perspective right here. Okay, so that is my quick down and dirty. Sorry I didn't finish my entire illustration there. I think it's hot. <laughs> but just to give you an idea of how the tool works, how easy it is to set things up using the perspective guide. Neon City Tanya, Neon I like City. it. Yeah. <laughs> if I had a little more time, then I would be able to complete that for you guys. That's, uh, that's such a great demo, Tanya. I love Neon City. And uh, again, like we're just eager to see what you're able to create. And, and like I said, uh, this is something that could be used, you know, in a very traditional sense in, in terms of lining up to the geometry. We showed Tanya lining to edges, but also, you know, for abstract art and composition, it's going to be a powerful tool. Now, the, the most fundamental thing people are working with, probably second only to brushes, would be layers. Like we know this is absolutely essential. And in all of our discussions, I mean, we met uh, routinely with a, a council of artists and we talk a lot about layers and its importance and the ability to, to do a very simple thing um, which is transform more than one layer at once is a really important improvement that we put into Painter X3 and oh and by the way there's a lot of improvements in the quality of the experience in using layers so we know that 12 needed some work there um, we started that work in 12 to 1 and have not let up since in terms of improving the stability of the layer stack, the layers themselves, and the performance of those layers and moving them around, working with groups, working with single layers, you can do it all. It's dramatically improved in X3. Um, so uh, um, in terms of cloning, there's more to that too. And that is cloning um, is also a very core workflow, a very essential workflow. And in 11, we had a feature where you could have a crosshair show up when you were cloning. And uh, this was a, a really important workflow. And it allows you to sort of guide that brush around edges and details of your clone source. Now in 12, um, we introduced uh, an, 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 a new feature to cloning, which is these embedded clone sources. And they're really nice because now you're able to actually save your sources with your image. And when you uh, are working on this, these files, you know, you, when you close it and open it back up, all those clone sources are ready to go again, and that's really nice. But 12 lacks the crosshair. So for X3, we put those two together. We've pushed the two together, and now you're getting this, um, the, the best of both worlds, basically. You could work the way you did in 12 with tracing paper. You could work with a clone and crosshair. And you'll see, Tanya's going to demonstrate, there's an additional workflow that comes with this, and that is the ability to quickly edit the clone source on the fly. Now, this is a lovely example from Karen Boniker, painter master and uh, teacher extraordinaire. And you'll see that um, she's able to create an impressionist painting quickly as a result of quick adjustments to her clone source, get that color and range that makes it so beautiful. So with that, I'll segue into yet another brilliant Tanya demo, and we'll go from there. So once we get back to painter here, we'll go ahead and close out of this document that we have. And I'm going to begin by showing you the multiple layer transform. So if we come out here, Brian Buse, who is an illustrator, was kind enough to allow us to use his painting file. So this beautiful painting, fairy tank. And the way that artists typically work, as I'm sure you all know, is to create various objects on layers. So if you need to adjust the composition at a later point in time, it will be easy to do so. And in Painter 12, we had a small issue in that we didn't allow you to make transformation adjustments to the objects on layers. So what I've done over in the layers palette, selected the fairy and the castle spires here. And if I come up to the edit menu, you can either free transform or I can just do a, a regular transform. In this case, I'm going to scale. And we'll take this up by 40%. Okay, and you can see it happened pretty quick there, but the objects are 40% bigger now, or the 
the elements that are on the layers. Now, up on the property bar, there is a fast preview mode. So if you have that turned on, it's going to speed up your workflow. It'll have the objects that you're transforming grayed out. So it depends on how you like to work, what kind of system you have. You can turn that on or off. Now, um, before I can actually work with these objects, I need to commit the transformation. But any of the transform options that you see on the property bar here are what you can apply to the objects on your layer. So now we can come down and I could just select the castle spires and I could continue to, you know, kind of perfect this. All right, so that is the multiple layer transform. Now next, because we have so many wonderful photo artists, we're going to show you the new cloning capabilities. So all that I've done with this file here, if I come up to the window menu and open up my clone source, and I'll go ahead and click to show the source image. So this is the original source image, and the only thing that I did to that file was go to the file menu and say file quick clone. And what it created is what you see over here on the right. Okay, so it is a painting file, a destination file, that doesn't have anything on it. So you've got the tracing paper that you can adjust the um, opacity level of, but if you turn the tracing paper off, it's a completely blank canvas. So the request from our photo artist, if I come up and grab a cloner brush, which is perfect for photo painting because by default, it pulls the colors from the original source image, and I start to paint. So we'll come out here and we'll just begin to paint. Now, this is a nice workflow, but the problem with it is that as you're painting, you can't really see those brush strokes building. So if you turn the tracing paper off, and we zoom in a little bit here for you, you can actually see your brush strokes building. And if you look over on the left, you have the reference point via the crosshair. So I know exactly where my brush is painting. Okay, so it's a much nicer way to preview how your painting is developing. So let's go ahead and we've got the voila version of this. I finished painting and if I come back over to the source image. So this particular client said, you know what, I like your painting but I want some different colored flowers in my hair. So sometimes clients have crazy requests and it's nice to be able to accommodate those on the fly. So if I come over to my effects menu, anything in the effects menu, you can make adjustments to your original source image now. So I'll go ahead and adjust colors. Okay, so we'll just pull that back a little bit. Let's make it a little bit more purple. I'm going to say okay. And it's giving me a message saying, hey, you're editing your source image, which is fine, because when I come back to my painting file, it's asking if I want to create a brand new clone source that will live in the clone source panel here and travel with my file. You could also update the original or discard all of it. So now we've got two clone sources. So let's come back up and grab one of my favorite brushes, and I know a lot of our painter masters love this brush too, the Sargent brush. And I'm going to turn on clone color. And now, when I begin to paint, you see that it's actually pulling the purple from the original clone source. So you can go back and forth between your clone sources. You can generate more clone sources on the fly. So I'm going to come back up. This time, let's do a little... Um, bright blue, perfect, okay, back over here. I'm gonna create my new clone source file. So now you see I've got the third clone source image and I can start painting away, okay? So I can just pull from that source. And she actually had another request. You know how those chalk hair colors are in? I'm gonna come back up to my cloners. She wanted to have a little bit of a blue streak in her hair, okay? so. This was her modified version of the wedding photo to surprise her husband. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that is the brand new cloning crosshairs and the ability to add effects on the fly that automatically save to your clone source panel. Did I forget anything before I pop out of here? <laughs> well, Penny, it was a great overview of that. Jeff had a question about which mm -hmm. brushes you were using. If you wouldn't mind just touching on uh, which particular brushes you oh, showed sure. in the demo. Okay, so um, the cloner, I was using the bristle brush cloner, very top one in the list. And then I went to the artist sergeant brush. 
So the only thing you have to keep in mind if you switch out of the cloners category, so let's try another one here. Let's say that I go to oils and I want a coarse wet bristle. If you start to paint now, it's painting with the um, color from the color wheel. Just remember to click the clone color button and it will pull, it's pulling the color, because we have blue as the color source. It'll pull the colors from the source. Did that answer the question? It did, thank you. Okay. That's nice. I want a blue streak in my hair. That is awesome, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. I'd like to see that. <laughs> So um, that's that's a really great uh, overview of cloning and and, it, it, and how essential it is to the workflow. And and I think the other thing that we do need to touch on, and we we've been seeing some questions in the chat log about this, is 64-bit uh, on Mac, and um, that that's been really uh, important um, discussion thread for us. We have been working on that, and it's not complete. 64-bit is still in the works. And what we've done to address that is we've created a feature that's called the Painter Memory Extender. And what this does is this, this is like a bridge to the 64-bit version that's in the works and allows you uh, to use all of the available memory on your Mac system. So, to, you know, on a, on a Painter 12, early Painter 12 build, for example, you'd be limited to around that 2 gigabyte uh, threshold. Uh, with Painter Memory Extender, you're able to tap in, like if you had a 8-gigabyte uh, machine, you'd be able to use more of that available memory, use more of that investment you've made in your Mac hardware. It's not a full 64-bit experience, but uh, it, is, it is a dra dramatic improvement. I mean, here are some results, um, you know, 36% faster in some specific test scenarios. Um, let's just talk about transformation. I mean, what we were doing is we were transforming multiple layers. You might have a very large document. This is on a, you know, an example, 8 gig, 2.8 2 gigahertz test system. And you can see even just initializing the transformation and saving the transformation, there's a lot of time that uh, is uh, knocked off there by um, using painter memory extenders. So, uh, you know, it really is a message from the team that uh, we hear your request for, for Mac 64-bit. We know it's late. We know you wanted it sooner <laughs> rather than later. And uh, the work is still continuing. We're working very hard on 64-bit. Um, but in the meantime, painter memory extenders should make a difference for those large documents and those essential workflows. Um, the other thing, too, is just, just an overall comment about performance. Um, painter X3 does have continued improvements in stability and performance. Our uh, feedback from our beta team is very, very positive about the stability of X3. So we do encourage everyone to give it a try. Thanks, Steve. So we're coming to the, uh, near to the end of the presentation. I uh, just want to make sure you're very clear in summary what's, what's in uh, X3. We hope you believe, based on what you've seen today, there's certainly something for everyone in terms of new users and existing users and something unique. We, as a, as a software vendor, do work in a competitive market and do endeavor to try to um, please our users and extend the value of our products. So we'll hope, hopefully that demo is clear, and we're very keen to get your, uh, your experience on Painter X3 as we progress. Now, another thing that we've done in terms of that total product experience is really expanded Corel.com. Uh, one of the things Tanya did a lot of work on last uh, several months, she thinks it feels like years, <laughs> she worked with several of our key customers uh, in various, if you will, sub-segments of the painter digital art market. You've got people that do photo painting, you've got traditional artists, uh, illustrators that are doing packaging and interesting uh, design for print or on the web, concept art, what have you. So what she's gone and done is pr created a whole bunch of more learning content in the eyes of our customers, our users. And we went off and asked them in the photo painting, photo painting space to let us know their top features that they really adore in Painter, in Painter, uh, Painter 12, Painter 11, Painter X3. So you'll see here a lot of interactive videos that uh, walk you through. Again, these are contributed by our users, not by us. Uh, reason number six there is vendor specific. That was our choice in terms of an interesting new feature uh, that really rolls up to that photo painting category. So a lot of hard work went in there. Anyone that's doing any teaching with students, uh, this is a great resource you'll be able to use. And similarly, if you're new to Painter and looking to hear it from other experts, this is a great place you can go to. And what we'll be doing over time is just coming up with a framework to make this a little more uh, scalable. We'll be able to let users add their own at some point in time and 
Who's to say that at one point we'll be able to trade training units at some point over the web? We're certainly looking at that as a real possibility rather than our, our current model, which is send us your stuff, we'll work it into a model and get it on our website. But more of this is uh, definitely a priority. The other thing we added was, uh, you know, as you scroll down the web page, is um, sort of an infomercial from some of our key customers that talk about uh, their, their workflow in the painting world. They actually, in the case of uh, photo painting here, this is Jeremy Sutton talking about his studio. You, he brings you right in there. Very personal, if you will, overview of what he does, why he does it, and why he likes using Painter for that particular art. And again, for the people that are new to Painter, it's a whole new set of getting started videos that um, you can go to and listen to. And of course, we've also got a brand new photo gallery. I would like to thank again all of, our, uh, all of our key users and, and, and uh, customers that responded to the request to be able to go in there and look at that photo gallery, again, by persona type or user type. So with that being said, we uh, want to plug an upcoming event. We certainly hope you do download the product. Uh, but one of the things that Steve was a real pioneer with uh, during our weekly sessions with our advisory board was running uh, online meetings and we decided to, uh, well, hell, Steve, it was your idea. You should talk with us. <laughs> Sorry. Sure, Eddie. Um, well, this is really neat. I mean, we, we were having routine sessions where we were talking about painter, but we were also were talking about the artist. We were talking about the art. And we had sessions where remotely um, artists were sharing what they were working on and sharing the kinds of art that they're doing. And we, we had one particular magical session where um, this is Claudia Saguero and uh, Jeremy Sutton. She was painting her live as she was singing. It was just fantastic. So we've decided to bring that experience to the public. We think it's really awesome. We really want you to join in. So the idea here is that there's an inspirational piece. There's something that kicks off the artwork to be done. And our esteemed photo painters, we've got uh, Jeremy Sutton, Claudia Seguero, and Heather Michelle. And uh, Heather's a painter. And she's going to be there. And the three of them are going to be painting together based on an inspirational image. It's a really cool image. It's a, it's a dancing image. And, um, and, and you can follow along if you wanted to. You could try and paint the image yourself also. Um, later, if you wanted to follow up with these esteemed painter users for feedback, for information about how they did it, um, you'll get that kind of information. It's all about bringing you on board, all about learning from those that are experienced, all about joining together, being less lonely, being a community in, in the digital art world. So we're really, really excited about what Paint Jam has to offer. And look for that really soon. There's there's a, a, a website. There's yep. a, you can go, go to Corel.com Paint Jam right now, and we have three live web sessions that will happen. They're going to be on Wednesdays starting October 14th, and then two Wednesdays um, following that. Oh, did I just say October? I meant August. <laughs> <laughs> so in just a couple weeks, and we encourage you to sign up for those because they'll they are truly going to be dynamic. Um, the artists are going to be passing control back and forth to one another, providing live collaborative feedback, and really letting you inside their process from start to finish. Um, and speaking of finishing, the finishing, they're probably even going to do a little bit of mixed media live painting from what I've heard. So I encourage you to, at a minimum, watch. We'll have everything recorded and posted up to the YouTube channel, but much more fun to join us live. So that is coming up shortly. Go to Paint Jam and find out about it. As far as our um, the product currently right now is available, you can download that off of Corel.com. We'll be shipping the um, physical product in just about two weeks here. So the price point is 429 full, 229 upgrade, and you can upgrade from two versions back. And then for anyone who is a student or a full-time instructor, we still offer the $99 education version of the product. And you can find out more about that on our website if you go to the education section. Andy, is there anything that you'd like to add? Just uh, looking over the remaining questions, the time is a uh, quarter to the hour, so we are certainly at our uh, advertised limit. We'll certainly take the additional QA as we finish here. I think that's the, uh, the end of the formal talking points we had. Uh, other than, obviously, in closing, we do hope you uh, take an opportunity to try Painter, 3, Painter X3 and certainly join in on our upcoming tours that are there.
Other questions. Uh, student pricing, it's $99. We'll be able to get that student edition on our website uh, on August 11th. That's just, uh, that's coming up a little later because of the new process it's putting in place. Uh, in the meantime, I urge you to download a 30-day trial and you'll certainly be able to access the full version of Painter in the, in the meanwhile. Other questions? Uh, thank you very much, Kim, for your feedback. That's wonderful. We really like to hear that sort of thing. Uh, people are asking about when Painter will be ported to a mobile or tablet, if you will, solution. We are looking at some upcoming technologies from uh, some partners of ours that have native Windows operating systems running. And we do have users that use Painter on uh, portable devices such as uh, Samsung, thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> Samsung and what have you. Uh, the iPad is an, an, another story. We're certainly um, taking a very close look at that and considering some options, including uh, some partnering options as well. It's, uh, it's certainly a, a more complex port for us on top of the existing operating systems we're supporting today. Those are the key questions and answers I think that have come up today. If there's anything else, you're welcome to post them on the Painter Factory or our Facebook page. On behalf of the Painter, Painter team that's with you today, and the development team and QA team upstairs. We want to thank you for joining in, and we really, again, look forward to your feedback.